Dr. Christopher Howell. Chris teaches at Allen University and is a research assistant at Duke University. His advertised topic was of gods and machines through visions of, uh, of AI and Christianity. But as I announced uh, yesterday, uh, he will be addressing a slightly different topic. And Chris, feel free to enlighten us. He, he had such a tremendous experience of late, uh, trying to make sense of uh, how to stave off uh, the chat GPT uh, uh, craze among his students. <laughs> yeah, so that maybe this will be something uh, I hope we could... I maybe keep the presentation a little shorter so we could have a conversation about it because I'm guessing a lot of you might have been in the same situation that I was of having to deal with students um, using it. And so I've been thinking a lot about AI this semester because of the explosion onto the scene of ChatGPT earlier, but at the end of last year and beginning of this year. And um, so, you know, I have some slides to share, um, but what happened and what caused the change here is I, I was going to present on religious relationships to AI, something I'm interested in, but at the end of May, uh, I do not have a big Twitter account, but I tweeted about an assignment that I that I did where I had my students use ChatGPT in the class to kind of teach them how it works, and uh, it got it exploded and ended up with like thirty thousand likes. And Elon Musk tweeted at me. It was it was a weird experience. <laughs> I was very stressed out as this was happening, and was I just like muted everything and like turned the, the uh, uninstalled Twitter from my phone and like went to play video games and tried to not pay attention because it was stressful. But um, in in uh, after that, I got contacted by some news agencies and uh, podcasts and Scientific American and Wired magazine about about writing about it. And so I thought I would share a little bit of what this experience was and what I did in the class. Um, we could talk about maybe ways to change. I think there's ways that this can be improved or, or changed. And obviously, like ChatGPT is going to continue to evolve. So um, there's there's a lot to discuss about it. So let me pull up um, slides here. So anyway, that's why my uh, presentation is a little bit different. I've been dealing with that for the past six weeks and didn't have enough time to really do what I was wanting to do. Um, but I hope that this may be helpful for you and for me um, to think about uh, moving forward. Um, so, you know, just to start off, like my own experience, you know, I study religion, science and technology, but I'm not someone who was an expert in AI. I hadn't studied AI. I didn't know what a large language model was um, until same so in January, really, uh, a friend of mine who's a programmer sent me a message in the in between fall and spring semester saying that I think you're going to need to pay attention to this. This is going to be really big really soon, and it's going to change a lot of things. And even so, I wasn't really sure what to make of that until I saw him in person and he showed me how it worked. And um, he pulled up the app on his phone and just like we typed in an essay about like, what would Wendell Berry think about AI? And it it gave a plausibly reasonable answer, um, which was pretty alarming for someone who had never encountered something like this before. Uh, so after that, I uh, really started thinking about AI a lot. I read a number of books about it, trying to learn some of the history, some of the concepts, um, try to integrate, integrate it into my own pre-existing knowledge already of religion and technology. And I was worried going into the next semester, which began in February, um, about how it might upend the classroom. And I wasn't really sure what to do. Uh, about that, you know, my first instinct um, would be like probably what a lot of yours is just tell students you can't use it, don't use it, I'm going to pay attention, I'm going to catch you if you use it, I know how to catch you because it writes in a distinctive way. I tried to do that, I just said when we had our first essay about a month into the semester, um, don't use chat GPT, like I'm going to be screening for it. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, a number of them did anyway, I ended up catching several students using it. Um, Two reasons. I mean, we're all familiar with the way it writes when you're not prompting it in a particular way. It's pretty robotic. Um, it has, I, I was kind of joking, like if <laughs> it uses punctuation correctly, but it writes in a really prosaic way. So I was kind of joking with undergrads, you know, like if it's using a semicolon properly and like a coordinating conjunction, it's probably written by an AI and maybe not, not by a, an 18 year old. Um, but the bigger way to catch it was fake sources. Um, this was something that is a problem with, with generative text AIs that they can confabulate or, or quote unquote hallucinate um, information that isn't true. It sounds reasonable, but it's not true. And so uh, this was how I caught most of them. The, the papers that sounded suspiciously robotic would have just made up things, made up quotes, made up authors, made up books, even page numbers and journals that didn't exist um, that were cited. 
And the interesting thing about that is that most of the students didn't know, I mean, I, I think everyone who used it and most of the students in the class didn't know that it could do that. They thought that it was always right. Uh, one student even tried to use it responsibly as a research tool, just asking it questions for sources and quotes, didn't know that it could make stuff up and then put those quotes in the paper. And so even, even in an attempt to try to like not just full on chi, but to just kind of use it to help um, mis misled the student. Uh, so my realization was really that like not only would students try to get away with it, but they would use it blindly. They didn't really understand what it was doing. They're sort of treating it like it's the computer from Star Trek or something where it just, you know, 100% is always accurate and gives you the right answer. Um, so the banning didn't work. Um, they tried to use it anyway. I think even there's even more downsides, I think, to trying to just forbid it. Um, because, you know, it's not like plagiarism where you could maybe have a paper trail. It can be difficult to prove if they don't admit it, it can be difficult to prove that they did it. Um, AI detectors like GPT-0 or the new Turnitin one, not always reliable. There was a news story about someone put the constitution, the US constitution into the uh, Turnitin AI detector and it came back like 80% positive AI generated. So it was seemingly not the most reliable way to, uh, to test it. Um, there could be things you can do in class, like have in-class handwritten essays. We could we could try to focus on those more, do oral exams. But like I say, in my situation where I'm an adjunct and I don't have a TA, I have too many students to really, it's not feasible to do oral exams. It's, it's just not gonna, I don't have the time. They don't have the time. There's gonna be no way to do it. Um, so a lot of it is just difficult and unfeasible. One thing that's interesting, maybe Google Docs uh, edit history could be a way to do essays, have someone turn in, a Google, an essay on a Google doc that they had to write the whole essay on. And then the professor can look at the edit history and check and see, like if they just copy and paste something from chat GPT, it would have no edit history. So you would be able to see what they were doing. It would maybe discourage um, cheating. But of course that's still time consuming and difficult as well. And they would even maybe have ways to get around it if they were that dedicated. But I thought the bigger problem in this was that um, the students just didn't really understand what it was doing. They didn't know how it worked. They were relying on it in ways that they shouldn't. And um, banning it may actually have the opposite effect of making them think it's better than it is, uh, that it can do more than it is able to do at the moment. Um, and so I decided then in, later in the class to, to create a different assignment that would have them use ChatGPT. I had them, I gave them a standard prompt on a topic that we recovered in class. And I had each student generate their own essay from chat GPT and then they would sort of grade it like they were the professor. So they had to put comments on the essay in Word. I gave them a questionnaire with all these questions about, um, you know, whether the argument was persuasive, what, what, what were good points that it made? Um, did it confabulate any false information? If it did, how did you prove that it did? What was wrong about it? Um, what have you learned about AI? You know, some of the general questions too. And what surprised me, and this is what went viral on the internet, was that all 63 essays had false information. Um, maybe I should have expected that since they were all using the same prompt, but I still was surprised. I, I didn't think that it would be that many. I figured like maybe half or something would have, would have false information, but every single essay had fake sources or sources that were real, but mischaracterized or misconstrued in some strange way. Um, so the goal that I think was successful was that I managed to show them at least like it's just the base usage of, of chat GPT that's running on GPT 3.5 or whatever the free model is, um, that it is generating the next most likely word in the sequence. It doesn't necessarily make it true. And so uh, this was really startling to a lot of the students. Their feedback was, they were pretty shocked uh, by this. Um, they had thought a lot of them that it was an infallible oracle, that it was always right, that it was like a search engine, that it would just give you information that was true. And when they learned that it could make things up, they actually reported more hesitancy towards using it. A few students even tried to dissuade some of their friends from using it. Um, they, a lot of them were really angry at um, Microsoft and OpenAI in particular for, for seemingly pushing this out so fast and trying to adapt it into everything before it seemingly is reliable, uh, or if it even can be reliable. I mean, there's, there, there could be like Gary Marcus. Is, so part of the reason it went viral is because I tagged Gary Marcus in the tweet. And he's been a known critic of, of uh, AI because he's claiming that the, the deep learning approaches that they're using are just never going to get past these problems, that there's always going to be this problem of, of this confabulated info. Um, but the other thing was it helps them practically too. You know, there's this discussions about what they're doing in class, especially in religious studies when I'm teaching, what, what, what skills they're getting from this. And this actually helps them practically understanding its strengths and weaknesses meant that they could use it more responsibly if they needed to for their, you know, their careers later on. Um, 
downsides to this assignment could be, you know, there's more than chat to chat GPT than just the base usage of just the chat bot. Like there's plugins, there's there's ways that you can reprompt it to get better. There's other AI, AIs like Bard or, or Find for programmers, for instance, um, that are more, that Find I think is more reliable for programming if you were to use it for that. Uh, so, so this is a, like a very limited introduction to how AI can work. Um, and another downside is that this could just end up teaching them how to cheat more effectively. <laughs> uh, you know, there's always kind of the downside of that. I'm not sure how to deal with that per se, but I figured it was worth trying to at least teach them how it works first. Uh, and then, you know, a big picture thing, what was the best part for me of the, the assignment was it stimulated uh, a really great class conversations about what education is for. So, so the humanities actually became much more important in these students' minds when they were confronted with this machine that was seemingly trying to ape them. And uh, so we had these great conversations about what makes humans distinct, our use of language, or how is our use of language different than the machine's usage of language, our understanding and critical reasoning that it doesn't seem to have. Um, a couple comments my students made that I thought were really insightful. One talked about how um, she was concerned that there's a danger that students might be trained to start just looking for the most likely plausible next answer, the most likely next word in a sequence, rather than thinking critically. They might start to think like the machine and not like a human. Uh, and another student uh, had a great comment about just what the purpose of essay writing is. This was really a time to sit and reflect and think that it's not just about the fact regurgitating facts or telling the professor what they you, you think they want to hear, but the sort of cognitive exercise that goes on in your head to strengthen the neural pathways that you need in order to be able to think critically. Taking that away or outsourcing it to a machine uh, could have negative consequences. I was really happy with their feedback. And so when I mentioned it, um, I actually ended up doing an interview on a radio program with two of the students and uh, the two that I mentioned here. And then we also did a, a, a um, uh, co-authoring an op-ed in Scientific American, which should be out at some point. I, I don't know when, um, but I co-wrote it with them, which was fun, a good experience. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, to conclude a kind of big picture that we talked about in class and I've focused on in my own writing too, uh, an idea I took from Neil Postman, who was a critic of technology and an educator in the US um, who died, uh, I think, in the early 2000s. Um, but he really was thinking about, you know, this is a lot of technology in the classroom is a time to think about the means and ends of, of education, because there's questions of means, which is mostly like a practical or engineering question. How do you get them to learn what you think they should learn? But then there's also the ends of like, what what is the point of all of this? And in dealing with AI in the classroom, it really made all the students and myself included uh, think much more deeply about what the end of this was, what the purpose of this uh, being in college is for, being in class, studying, writing essays, and so on. And so I was very happy with the way it turned out. Um, but of course, there's plenty that could change. There's uh, technology changing so fast, there's going to be new things that we're going to have to deal with soon. So I don't know how long this kind of assignment would really be effective. but. Um, in the short term, it was helpful. I, I would be interested in any questions or comments or feedback or ideas from, from the rest of you too. So that's all, I'll go ahead and conclude there and then we can uh, have a conversation hopefully. Thanks a lot, uh, Chris. Uh, this was quite of, uh, of an experience and I am certain it uh, well, uh, yeah, it resonates uh, well with uh, most of us. Um, what you said at some point that uh, uh, these, uh, answers these essays of uh, of machines that might be reasonable but not true you know uh, this reminds me of uh, uh, how uh, Isaac Asimov uh, characterized uh, robots uh, they can be rational or plausible but not reasonable <laughs> uh, anyway uh, let's uh, roll the ball let's uh, let's see who who uh, who has uh, comments or uh, questions to to ask I think I accidentally, I was trying to click the chat and I think I, I think I hit the stop recording and then, and then I, I started it back up. So I think it's okay. It, it, it's okay. It's uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, it's, it's fine. So, uh, Father Glenn, go for it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris, uh, for a really timely and interesting presentation. Um, the media has really kind of pumped up chat GPT as sort of the dawn of the apocalypse. And yet your description of it, and some of us in this room, probably our own experience as well matters with this, is that it's still fairly clumsy and it's still producing unreliable information. 
And um, I mean, I did the vanity thing of Googling, not Googling, <laughs> sorry, that GPTing my own name to see what the internet <laughs> And this was the response. Um, Glenn O'Brien has is is an is not known to us, probably because his work is not well enough known, or he hasn't produced anything of real quality to be known. So right there, I realized Chat GPT was not a very accurate. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, all jokes aside, to what extent do you think? Because in the whole field of AI, there is this tendency, isn't there, to overstate, you know, the imminence of the singularity or the rise of the robots or whatever. Is it just that that's good media fodder? We've all been brought up on science fiction and we like that kind of apocalyptic idea. Is it all just a sort of a beat up in the media? You know, there's this famous story recently, well known story, where, uh, you know, an AI expert quit his job because. Chat GPT was too powerful. He didn't want to deal with it anymore. And that became like representative of every AI expert's opinion. But the AI experts I talked to were like, like it's worrying about COVID-19 breaking out on the first Martian colony, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> the idea that Chat GPT would be the end of humanity. So I just wondered if you might comment on just the extent of the media overexposure of this. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I feel like it's kind of, Yes and no, it's both overblown and, and not, I think at the same time, it, it's try to unpack that. I mean, this, this is not new to have this kind of problem in AI research. There, there have been in the past these, these huge explosions of excitement of AI that then kind of die out. There's been two uh, so-called AI winters in the past where funding dried up uh, when it seemed like it was hitting a wall it would like expert systems, for instance, were like too difficult, I think, to, to produce it the scale that they needed. Um, there was there was a lack of interest then in the government's funding and another private uh, funder. So there would be kind of a cooling of, of, of research. What has changed in the past about a little over 10 years has been machine learning is now doable because of the amount of data that there is on social media and the amount of processing power that is now possible because of what NVIDIA's GPUs. Uh, that has changed things so that some of the the older technologies are, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, so I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but <laughs> that, that, that has changed things so that now it is, it is it is able to do stuff that it never would have been able to do before. So like, so could we have another AI winter where, where possibly the, these new machine learning, deep learning neural networks are, are not going to be as maybe effective long-term as they look like they might be now? That's possible. Uh, there even maybe some signs because of chat GPT's problems and some of the other issues with self-driving cars or like how Watson didn't really seem to do very well at MD Anderson as a medical AI, that maybe it isn't going to be as quite uh, apocalyptic or, or earth shattering as people think. And that could, I mean, who knows, maybe that could happen. I, I tend, my point, my perspective has tended to be sure you know maybe there's some wild sci-fi scenario where skynet could take over or something but like in the short term there's all these problems of ai that are happening today with, with political misinformation with uh, the biases that are that these networks and the, the, the ais can end up incorporating because they're training data um that there can be technological unemployment uh, people losing their jobs even if chat gpt is not really that good of a writer if it's a cost effective you know you can see certainly plenty of corporations and companies will lay off people and replace them with an ai that can do a good enough job you know as long as it can save money for copywriting purposes or so on if the stakes are low enough um so those are things and then like we've been dealing with ai for a decade through social media and a lot of the um, extremism of algorithms on twitter they're pushing people or on facebook that push people into extremist political groups have you know been because of AI? So the immediate near-term stuff is real, real problems. I think that's not overhyped. The the idea that it you know could end the world or something is probably, in my perspective, probably not true. But you know who knows? Thanks, Chris. Um, any other comments or questions? Amina, go for it. Okay, I was looking for the hand. I remember when we shared this session, uh, Christopher, in um, in Colorado, um, about okay. First, I thought was it what was important. My husband teaches, so he has problems with Chat GPT, and I will present to him 
and his response has been to stop. So he has them write essays by hand and, and it's just trouble. So I really like what you presented. But what I really thought was important is that when you showed them, taught them how it works and they figured out that its information is confabulated, they were less likely to, to use it. And it provided an opportunity to, to think critically. And I remember there was a study when we shared the panel in Denver that I presented it, this was in the context of, of COVID and misinformation. And simply asking people how accurate you think this is was enough to uh, deter them from sharing misinformation. So in this case, you showed the same thing that simply asking the students how accurate is this essay, it also deters them uh, from from you know, using it or critically thinking about it. So I was just thinking how important that question is to ask how accurate is this? How accurate are these references and, and so on? That, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, and I think that's that's super important because especially like those of us that maybe study technology and are a little bit more aware of it, I think overestimate how much just the average student or the average person will actually know about this. Most of my students had not even tried to use it. They had only really heard things on the media. Um, the Snapchat AI had appeared about a week before the assignment. And that was the first time any of them had knowingly interacted with one and it really freaked them out. And so I think like, the amount of education and, and sort of just base level knowledge that needs to be imparted about this this stuff is 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 uh, pretty basic. Like they, 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 we need to kind of start at the beginning, I think, if we're going to try to figure out how to deal with it, because we we might be overestimating how much they really know about it. Um, so doing doing that kind of thing, just showing them, just asking how reliable is it, is I, I hopefully an effective starting point. Great. The eye. Do you have a question comment? Yes, if there's time for another quick question, Christopher, thank you for that. Um, in, in Australia, you know, the universities and, and our um, accrediting body have had a series of, of webinars all year from going from the crisis of when it was first introduced to sort of learning to live with that and, you know, how do we redesign our curricula to uh, incorporate um, language models. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about it um, here, at least. Um, we did have the situation where a lawyer actually um, wrote a briefing and, and uh, used it in court and was discovered to have just fabricated all these cases that the judge didn't know about. So that hit the news. One, one thing that interests me is the ethical questions around um, language models, because that data is sourced from, you know, all of us putting stuff on, onto the net. And so the material that, that is generated never um, references the sources, you know, from which those, those words are gained. And so, so there's the ethical problem of being in academia where we're so concerned about not plagiarizing and we're so concerned to, to reference accurately and to teach that to our students and to do it ourselves as academics. And yet um, a tool such as this simply is outside of that, that ethical requirement. It's, it's just beyond it completely. Um, so even if students dare to use Wikipedia, um, they, they will you know, have to reference Wikipedia, um, which acknowledges that you know, a, a variety of people have been involved in, in the creation of that article. But ChatGBT is, is beyond that again. So there are ethical questions around who owns that material. The second ethical question that I've come against is, um, is it's okay if we're all using a free version of ChatGPT, but, um, but who has access to subscription versions, which, which are going to be better? And, in, uh, you know, it, their improvement is going to accelerate and leave the rest of us behind who are just using a, an open access version. And so there's real equity problem there as well. So I just wonder if you want to just kind of jam on those couple of ideas. Yeah, I mean, so I had my students use the free version and I was concerned, like, I didn't want to make them do this either. If they were uncomfortable making an account, like putting their phone number in it, I, I told them, like, just I'll generate an essay for you um, so you don't have to do that. And one student was very uncomfortable by it. And so, so I did that. But um, no, I mean, this is a huge, this is a huge problem. There's all sorts of ethical things in this that are really hard to tease out. Um, 
one of the things I was thinking of when we talked about a lot in the class is also just the, the biases in the training data. You know, the the uh, I mean, the companies are very careful about this. They try to make sure that it doesn't reproduce the biases that it might take in. Like we all remember maybe that Microsoft Tay bot that was on, it was an AI that was on Twitter for less than a day and it started denying the Holocaust and doing all because, you know, that's that's what it was interacting with on the internet. And so, they're, you know, they're careful to try to not let stuff like that happen. But even so, you know, you can't always be aware of your own biases, right? Amazon had an issue where they had an AI that was not hiring any women. It was it was a, it was an AI that was supposed to make hiring recommendations, and they learned, they realized after a while that it was making no recommendations to hire women. And they figured out that it was because their training data didn't have a lot of women getting hired, and it learned that, and so it started just reproducing the biases that were already there. Um, ironically, that alerted them to the existence of the bias that they didn't realize they had, but. Um, this is this is a huge problem that I you know how to deal with it in the classroom and how to do with students I, I have no idea you know it's just it, 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 the minimum at the beginning is just to tell them that it does do this that it isn't infallible that it's taking in the good and bad from us and we can try to prune it and train it in ways that it maybe will mitigate it but it's probably not going to be able to get rid of it and I, I think this is actually one of the things I wanted to think of my original idea was that you know there's been this sort of political and religious kind of conflict over chat GPT because it does have a worldview you know it's coming at things from a particular perspective that it's sort of trained on and um you know certain extremist religious groups are not happy with that and they want to have an AI like they, the creator of gab wanted to have an ai that was reflecting a right-wing christian viewpoint um, and that would be its sort of outlook and um thinking about the worldviews and the biases and the ideas that go into the machine learning, I think it's is uh, crucial, but we have to start at the very beginning to really be able to do it. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, I know uh, Sammy is already here, but uh, I, I'd like to add something uh, and perhaps a, a topic that isn't usually addressed when we talk about uh, using uh, all these uh, fancy tools. It's, you know, we are like kids, like in a cake shop. Uh, we want that lolly. Uh, once the lolly is available, we want it. Uh, and I think one of the, the things that should be also discussed is, uh, well, we need a catechism, uh, you know, a user guide for uh, uh, all these uh, uh, gizmos that, that appear. Because uh, regardless of the imperfections of uh, technology or another, uh, yes, uh, yes, Mick, yeah, addicted to cakes. Look at me. So this is why I have to hide here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, regardless of the, uh, the imperfections of, of a technology that is emerging, uh, there's still the problem of the user. Uh, would you care to, to say a few words about this? Because your students are, are users, isn't it, Chris? Sorry, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. To well, it's, to. It's, it's, it's the topic of, you know, okay, so we all uh, look at the ethical aspect of mm -hmm. a technology, uh, how ethical, well, fine all good uh, but how about the user the, the user is never uh, questioned uh, but we seem to be rushing to use all these things indiscriminately and i think uh, uh, rather than pointing fingers to a uh, an emerging technology or an established technology fully developed technology uh, we should also think uh, in terms of us users so that's my uh, yeah, no, I think, I, yeah, I, I understand now. I, I, um, no, I, that is hugely important. That was what one of the benefits of doing this assignment was it made the students reflect more about the way that they think and how they think and how machines think and the difference between those things. Because it's not just to say, like, don't use ChatGPT, it's all bad, it's going to ruin the world or something. Like, that's not, I think, the, the takeaway I wanted them to have. But um, I was, hoping and I think it did help them a little bit to sort of instill a bit more confidence and, and self-respect in their own writing that like they they you know their ideas can be good too just because they're not as fast as the AI or something you know they can still think in depth and, and critically and uh our own you know we relate to it in a symbiotic way like you mentioned we do need to think about the way that we interact with it this this is maybe could recapitulate what happened with social media 10-15 years ago we all rushed into it really quickly and you know our behavior on there has <laughs> made things complicated in the last decade and, and uh, that is partly because of the algorithms and because of the companies that made the, made it but it is also because of the way that we conduct ourselves on there too and um certainly that needs to be taken into consideration with with uh dealing with ai as well grace thanks a lot <laughs>